So this is a, this is taken from the the the, the Netter Atlas. So it was used when uh, I was a medical student in the late 80s, uh, and uh, my daughter she studied medicine and now she still uses this uh, Netter picture. So it's, it's interesting. So it shows a, a, an old person. Uh, it's winter outside, so it's cold. He carries a bag, so that's a uh, weight. He has have has, has had a. a large meal and all these in this night so these are all uh, all uh, uh, somehow predisposing events for my father infarction he has a, a chest pain because uh, there's been a sudden closure of uh, uh, his coronary artery and and so there is a portion of his myocardium here that is dying and if nothing happens and this person uh, survives arrhythmias he has 90 percent 98 percent of of, of, uh, of surviving the event However, uh, progressively this uh, ischemic region becomes a region of uh, necrotic uh, uh, cells, uh, which then progressively transform into a scar with no possibility of, uh, uh, of changing this uh, course. And the scar in a, a large series of cases will lead to remodeling of the heart, dilatation, and heart failure. Once the person is diagnosed with heart failure, he has a, a 50% probability of not being around of the, uh, only after five years. So it's, the prognosis is much worse than any 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 kind of uh, uh, cancer diagnosis. Uh, if the person is lucky, he is uh, transported uh, uh, to an hospital within a couple of hours. He is uh, um, brought to the cath lab, and the interventional cardiologist opens up a balloon in his coronary and restarts flow. This uh, limits the amount of uh, damage that is created. However, there is uh, still an additional damage also caused by reperfusion. So this is a bit bigger, but still smaller than original infarct. And this is healed by formation of, of a scar. What we are completely missing in this picture is the possibility of intervention. So what we would like to have is a drug which can be administered here or here to limit damage, and then uh, a drug that can be administered here that uh, might induce regeneration of the lost myocardium. Because the big problem of this condition is that uh, adult cardiomyocytes uh, are not capable to replicate. There are studies uh, showing that uh, a person who is uh, more than 70 has more than 50% of his uh, myocardial cells, which are exactly the same cell which, uh, with which he or she has been born, which is a uh, uh, amazing thinking of cells that uh, remain alive for uh, so many years performing a mechanical, uh, mechanical function. But this is exactly the case for uh, most of our organs. If you think of the brain, we are born with uh, approximately 100 billion of neurons and we keep losing neurons every day, 80,000 neurons every day. You are losing neurons, I'm losing neurons while we are speaking together. And uh, the, lack, uh, the lack of proliferation, for example, occurs in the eye. We are born with a certain number of retinal cells, uh, pigment uh, epithelium cells, uh, neurons in the, in, in the eye, and we don't regenerate them. And, uh, and the same is uh, uh, for the inner ear, the same is for beta cells in the pancreas, for cartilage cells. So in the, 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 the vision of modern medicine, uh, to me, is a vision of medicine in which the biggest problem is that uh, we have a fixed lifetime, 120, 125 years, determined by the species. So our belonging to the Homo sapiens species set us this limit. And we are increasing our actual um, uh, uh, life uh, time to now in Italy we live more than 80 years uh, for males and 85 years for females and while there is a fixed wall then we are progressively approaching this wall and this correlates with the incapacity of uh, uh, the regenerative and repair capacity in most organs in our bodies in terms of medicine this has a uh, tremendous consequences because, uh, for example, if you look just at the brain, 30 people, 30% 30 of people over 80 years have a dementia, which is the vast majority of cases of Alzheimer's disease. And I just told you that uh, basically we, in Italy we live uh, uh, more than 80 for men and more than 85 for, for, for women. Or uh, retinal degeneration affects one person out of three. One person out of two after 75 doesn't hear well because they have degeneration of the inner ear, we think that uh, hearing loss in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in, in old people 
is a, a sort of physiological trait. It's not a physiological trait. It, it is a disease due to loss of cells in the inner ear. And the situation is particularly uh, 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 terrible for uh, heart failure, uh, due to, uh, especially to myocardial infarction. And uh, because of this affects 15 million people worldwide and has this uh, very bad prognosis. If you look at the causes of the de death at the beginning of the 1900, uh, there were um, uh, a vast majority of people dying of infectious diseases, pneumonia, influenza, tuberculosis, gastrointestinal uh, uh, infections, uh, diphtheria. And now basically 20% of people die because of cancer and 30% of people die because of heart disease or ischemic uh, cerebral disease. And if you think that this is a problem of our Western society, you will be completely, completely wrong. This is taken from the World Health Organization. And basically, the, uh, one of the major problems in the uh, metropolitan cities in Asia or in Africa is not due to the infectious diseases it used to be uh, 10 years ago only, but it's due to non-communicable diseases which cause 30% of death in these uh, uh, countries and in particular to ischemic uh, heart disease. So all these conditions uh, um, I'm, I'm speaking of are conditions which are due to the loss of cells which don't replicate and uh, uh, also they have another thing in common that there is no therapy. There is no therapy for any of these conditions. For heart disease, for example, I, 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 I took, there are six, six drugs for which a person with heart failure uh, can, can be treated. These are listed here. This is taken from the Mayo Clinic website just to, to signify one of the top uh, caring institutions in the, in the world. But this is the same treatment that one can find here at the University Hospital in Trieste. And, and here I played a bit and see, to see when these drugs have been introduced in clinical practice. So digitalis and diuretics date back to the 1910s, 1900s. Then in the 70s, the two drugs that really changed the fate of uh, uh, heart failure treatment, beta, beta blockers and uh, uh, ACE inhibitors. And in the 90s, uh, the uh, sartans, uh, the, the um, uh, angiotensin II receptor blockers. And that's it. So meaning that a person who is admitted for heart failure at the Mayo Clinic today or the Catinara Hospital here in Trieste today, he is, uh, she is treated with the same drug combination and she would have been treated more than 20 years ago. So it's more than 20 years that we have no new drugs for this condition. And all these drugs don't tackle the issue of losing cardiomyocytes and not regenerating cardiomyocytes, but uh, they deal more with the problem of having the surviving cardiomyocyte to contract a bit better. But obviously, if you don't have the substrates or the number of cells, then there's very little to do. And so basically, this is the reason why we think that the new drugs have to be found among the categories of biological drugs, uh, namely proteins, growth factors, monoclonal antibody that blocks uh, unwanted functions, cell replacement, obviously genes. And with the category of genes, I also include small RNAs and anti-small anti RNAs. Obviously, the heart has to proliferate during uh, the neonatal fetal life, and it is indeed the first organ that forms, the first organ that starts to function, starts pumping very early during embryonic development, but uh, it stops completely dividing immediately at birth. So, for example, if you do a very simple experiment, you take a mouse and you inject bromodesosiuridine, which marks replicating cells being incorporated in S phase, Immediately at birth, you will see that uh, more than 35% of cardiomyocytes are in active X phase, so they replicate. If you do this uh, after uh, um, uh, two weeks, then, uh, or in adulthood, this uh, percentage drops in, uh, suddenly to zero. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the consequences uh, are very, very evident because, uh, and this is work performed by, by Hisham Sadek and Eric Olson, if you make damage to the heart, for example, by cutting the apex of the heart, immediately in the first week after birth, you have complete regeneration of the heart. But if you do a damage after the first week of life, instead of regeneration, you have formation of, of a scar. There is a famous case by, by, by Joseph Penninger in Austria in, 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 in three years ago, in which he reported a case of a neonate who had um, myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction is very rare in neonates, but this girl was coming from a family with inherited disorders of coagulation. So she had, by chance, a thrombus occluding her coronary 
and they, she was uh, admitted to the hospital in uh, emergency. She couldn't uh, breathe, and uh, she had all the symptoms of myocardial infarction. Doctor treated her with the fibrinolytic uh, support. They tried to support her to to, um, to, uh, to 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 survive, and they succeeded in supporting. And thrombolytic uh, therapy permitted the clot to be dissolved. And this lady, this girl, had a very big infarct. And then they followed this uh, girl for. Uh, up to a couple of years by all uh, I mean top of care um, measurements including MRI and other and other uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of follow-up and uh, after one year she was completely normal so her heart had completely regenerated in contrast to what happens in adults so it means that cardiomyocytes have the capacity to regenerate but for some reason this capacity is completely blunted at birth. Birth is a, is a, a, a tremendous event for, for a mammal. It is an event in which, uh, uh, for example, the heart, which is a, a venous organ in the womb of the mother, becomes an arterious organ and it is flooded by oxygen coming from the lung. And this can be a signal that stops, uh, stops proliferation. Uh, a couple of years ago, we, we, we worked together with Desham Sadek in Texas to show that really the oxygen tension is a critical determinant to stop cardiomyocyte proliferation because, uh, um, uh, because it induces a DNA damage that, that blocks the cell cycle. Uh, obviously, uh, this is not, cannot be the only, the only uh, factor, also because fibroblast and endothelial cells in the heart are uh, exposed to oxygen, still they continue to proliferate. Something else that occurs in the heart, for example, is a switch of oxidative uh, Met, uh, from uh, of metabolism to uh, uh, glucose utilization to fatty acid oxidation. This also can be a signal to stop proliferation. Or most important that uh, the heart in the womb of the mother still pumps, but that it doesn't pump against a great pressure because it is the mother heart that sustains the circulation. While immediately after birth, it has, the, it has to be the child's heart who has to pump against the big pressure. And this could be a signal that tells the cells stop proliferating and enlarge your cytoplasm to build up uh, contractile structures. I mean, the heart of a neonate is this size, the heart of a, an adult is this size, it's only increasing cytoplasm, it's not more, more cells. Whatever the problem, whatever the reason, the problem is uh, what to do with uh, a, a person with myocardial infarction, which uh, there is a formation of a scar. And the problem is not trivial, because there are from two to four billion cardiomyocytes that are lost, uh, after myocardial infarction. And people have tried over the last 15 years uh, to replace these cardiomyocytes by injecting first in the heart uh, stem cells or putative stem cells from for va various derivation. Was it fraud? Was it bad science? Was it exaggerated hope? Nobody knows, but this has been a complete uh, failure. So bone marrow stem cells in the heart don't become cardiomyocytes, mesenchymal stromal cells don't become cardiomyocytes. Uh, many questions, and uh, I, I personally don't believe there are uh, adult uh, uh, cardiomyocytes uh, endogenous uh, stem cells. In any case, clinically, there is no proof that any stem cells can regenerate the heart. One can regenerate the heart certainly by injecting cardiomyocytes. Uh, we are collaborating with Chuck Murray in Seattle, to, who uh, obtains uh, human embryonic stem cells, convert these cells into cardiomyocytes, and then implant these cardiomyocytes formed in vitro. But this is a tremendous uh, and, and very difficult uh, setting because uh, this is the most prevalent uh, disease in the world now, the disease for which uh, more people die, and at the same time, the only treatment that is foreseen is uh, having one billion cardiomyocytes being expanded from one billion embryonic stem cells and being implanted. Very difficult uh, to achieve. Uh, there is a possibility uh, by proof of principle studies uh, to convert fibroblasts to cardiomyocytes, but this again by uh, the delivery of cocktails or transcription factors, but uh, again uh, this would require one billion fibroblasts to be converted in one billion cardiomyocytes, and there is no way of transferring effectively genes into the heart uh, using the current generation of retroviral or antiviral uh, vectors. There is no way of selectively targeting fibroblasts. Very, very difficult. However, if uh, uh, you look more carefully, it is absolutely true that from the clinical point of view, the heart is a post-mitotic organ, so it doesn't replicate. 
However, um, um, uh, Rich Lee in Harvard and Hans Friesen in, 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 in uh, Stockholm have provided evidence that there is a very limited renewal. So it is true that a person of 70 years uh, has more than 50% of his heart that is exactly the same cells with which he was born, but still the other almost 50% has been renewed over a 70 years lifetime. So there is a possibility of renewal. And by imaging mass spectrometry, uh, Rich Lee showed that there is a 1% renewal per year in the heart. So clinically it means zero, but biologically it means that there is a potential for this. And then there are other species in which when the heart is damaged, for example, zebrafish or salamander, you can regenerate completely the heart. In 40 days, you have complete regeneration. So a few years ago, we have been among the first to think, uh, well, let's start another avenue. Let's try to regenerate the heart by stimulating the endogenous capacity of cardiomyocytes to proliferate, not implanting anything, but transferring something, convincing the existing cardiomyocytes to re-enter the cell cycle. Obviously, this uh, is a very nice proposition, but it requires at least two elements. First, that you have the right uh, factor that promotes cardiomyocytes proliferation. A second, that you have a, de a delivery route for these uh, factors. Now, fortunately, for the delivery route, it is uh, much easier because uh, f for uh, um, a strange circumstance, there is a class of viral vectors which are exquisitely uh, cap capable to transfer genes in post-mitotic cells. And these are vectors based on uh, the adeno-associated virus, nothing to do with adenovirus. It belongs to the family of parvoviruses, but it is a defective virus that was originally discovered as a contaminant of cultures also infected by adenovirus. It is a very small virus. When I speak in front of bi nanobiotechnology audiences, I describe this as a, the perfect nano by biotechnology particle, biological nanotechnology particle. It has a, just a single-stranded DNA uh, and, uh, as a genome with two herpins, so 146 nucleotides, surrounded by 60 proteins, and that's it. 20 nanometers in diameter. To give you a reference, the, the GFP is a sort of Coca-Cola can with three nanometers in diameter, so it is more, more or less in the same range. And it has only two genes, rep and cap. They can be completely removed, substituted with any cassette you want to clone into this virus. And what's remaining of the virus is just the two inverted terminal repeats. And if you prepare these uh, uh, viruses, you can do that uh, easily in, uh, in cell culture, and you can purify this virus at a very high titer. And you use this viral preparation to uh, transduce any cell that grows in your incubator. Um, name uh, fibroblast endothelial cells, uh, embryonic stem cells, uh, uh, any kind of uh, hematopoietic stem cell derived cell, anything that grows, all cancer cells in the incubator, is the worst vector you could use. Never use a navy vector to, for gene delivery in vitro. However, if you take the same viral particle and you inject them directly in vivo, you will see that uh, these vectors go directly into post-mitotic cells, so all cells in the retina. Uh, retinal pigment epithelium cells, uh, photoreceptors or ganglionar cells, in the brain to neurons but not to glia, in the muscle to skeletal muscle fibers, uh, in uh, the heart into cardiomyocytes, but not fibroblasts, not endothelial cells. And there are some variants of the, uh, the, the, the 60 protein from the capsi that define different serotypes that are, uh, confer the vectors the capacity of systemic injection. So basically you can inject AV9 serotype vectors, IP or IV. They travel in the circulation and they, they end up in skeletal muscle cells or in cardiomyocytes uh, precisely. There is a very interesting biology behind the uh, reason why these vectors are selective for post-mitotic cells. And it has nothing to do with the receptor but it has to do with the processing of the viral genome once it enters the cells. So the viral genome is single-stranded DNA. It enters the cells, replicating cells have proteins that recognize these DNAs as damaged DNA. It has a herping, a single-stranded DNA, all features that define the damaged DNA. And so these proteins impede conversion from single strand to double strand, and then it, they uh, eventually destroy the vector. I'm speaking like prote of proteins uh, involved in the first steps of a molecular recombination, like MR11, RAT50, MBS1, MDC1. And, uh, and so uh, this is the reason why these vectors are ineffective. 
Uh, while uh, post mitotic cells basically don't <laughs> express these proteins because of molecular recombination requires S phase. S phase will never occur in cardiomyocytes or in a neuron, and so these proteins are transcriptionally down regulated. So the vector ends of these cells and happily can be converted from single strand to double strand, and then this stays there basically forever. So here in the, in the ICGB, we have a facility for the production of this vector. We produce four AB vectors every week, and we have been doing this uh, you know, in the last 15 years, where we have really literally produced uh, thousands of AV preparations that we use for a number of applications ourselves or in collaboration with laboratories worldwide. And so for us, it was very easy to say, okay, we want to trigger proliferation of cardiomyocytes. Let's start by taking genes that are known to be expressed during the embryonic life in cardiomyocytes and, and stimulate uh, uh, muscle cell proliferation. These are also the Yamanaka factors to, to push these cells to proliferate. And so we had individual AV vector and started these vectors after myocardial infarction. Nothing. None of these can reawaken proliferation of cells. Other people tried with other factors that are involved in the cell cycle, uh, regulation of the sp 4 the and CME, nothing. The best you can is to push cells to enter S phase and then there is mitotic catastrophe and the cell die. So we thought, well, we, we, we can't do that with a single regulator. Let's think of regulators which are more broad. And obviously our attention, this was uh, um, six years ago, six, seven years ago, turned to microRNAs because each microRNA can target tens of hundreds of different uh, factors. So they are global regulators and basically they are involved in any, in any biological function. So we reasoned, uh, we, we, we asked ourselves, is there any microRNA that uh, could stimulate cardiomyocyte proliferation? So to make the story short, we had a library at that time of almost 1,000 microRNA in a high throughput screening format. We screened each of these microRNAs uh, for proliferation and uh, we ended up with the identification of 40 microRNAs that are capable to stimulate cardiomyocyte proliferation. Proliferation, the screening was performed by high content microscopy uh, uh, looking at BRDU incorporation, but this was really proliferation because uh, it really in, in, they, they induce uh, an increase in the number of cells. Look at, for example, this picture here. These are neonatal rat cardiomyocytes stained in, in green with an anti alpha acting in antibody. After six days of culture, they are, they've stopped proliferating. This is the same culture after the treatment with this microRNA 1825, which is one of the most active. You see that basically this cells fill up the plate. For us, it was very easy to build a vector that uh, contains the genes for uh, the two most effective uh, uh, factors. And uh, we provided these factors uh, in vivo after myocardial infarction in the form of AV vectors. The two microRNA are the two most effective we had. Uh, 99A and 590, and the results were really stunning. So these are huge infarts. Uh, this is the left ventricle, the right ventricle. Huge infarts formed in control animals at 12 days and 60 days, and these are the small uh, infarts that we see after uh, giving this microRNA that stimulate uh, uh, proliferation and, uh, and regeneration. This uh, was the first demonstration. It was when we had a lot of publicity at that time. First demonstration, you can really stimulate the endogenous, uh, endogenous proliferation. And uh, uh, this is an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine by my honest friend who said, well, now we have the possibility of injecting something in the heart that uh, induces, uh, induces uh, proliferation. We see uh, at the end of my talk that this is not as easy as uh, you can draw in, in a cartoon. Which are the target cells for mirror action? Uh, are they existing cardiomyocytes or they are some sort of stem cell population in the heart or recruited to the heart? We did a fate mapping experiment uh, basically in which we, uh, we crossed a mouse which contained the alpha myosin heavy chain promoter upstream of a tamoxifen inducible Cree. So basically, this Cree is expressed only in mature cardiomyocytes and crossed it uh, into, with a, to a flox mouse and then gave tamoxifen for seven days. So we converted all mature cardiomyocytes into green cells. And then uh, we did uh, uh, myocardial infarction after, with the injection of the NAV vector expressing the microRNA. And the question was, uh, the cells that uh, after the microRNA incorporate bronzosurity, so they are pushed to proliferate, are they black or are they green? If they're black, they come from elsewhere. If they're green, they were the previously existing cardiomyces which are pushed to proliferate. And the answer was that they are all, all green. 
So basically, you see cardiomyocytes that incorporate uh, bromelosus urid in the context of a very green cytoplasm. These are other pictures, you see very big cardiomyocytes which uh, have uh, proliferated uh, upon the response to these uh, microRNAs. We become more audacious, and we saw something that uh, has never been seen in biology before, that is an adult cardiomyocyte put in culture, this enormous cell with this uh, very large cytoplasm that uh, upon stimulus of the microRNA, they start incorporating bromodesos uridin. They enter the uh, cell cycle. This is a, an antigen Ki67 that marks the cell cycle. You see also, you see staining of the uh, chromosomes. And they also go through G2M. This is staining for phosphoestone E3. When you mark G2M, you see these uh, mitotic uh, chromosomal, chromosomal spreads. How do these microRNA work? And uh, uh, I don't want to go into details, but the, the story is quite interesting uh, because all the microRNAs seem to impart, to, to impact on uh, uh, at least two specific pathways inside the cells. So basically what we did was to take uh, the, 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 the top six effective microRNAs and transfect them into cardiovascular and, and do next generation sequencing to obtain the transcriptional profile. And then we analyzed this profile. And the results are summarized here. So basically, the two pathways that are impacted by all the microRNA are, one, the HIPPO pathway. So basically, the HIPPO pathway has an active transcription, a positive transcriptional coactivator, which is YAP, which is brought into the nucleus and drives expression of pro-proliferated genes. And YAP is known to be highly involved in cardiomyocyte proliferation during the embryonic and fetal life. However, the protein is kept inactivated by phosphorylation, and then it is degraded, uh, by a series of kinases which are present in the cytoplasm. And there are several kinases which are capable to directly phosphorylate uh, YAP, or that are activated by phosphorylation by other upstream kinases, like one MST1, LAX1, STK38L. Well, all these microRNAs one or the other uh, uh, targets are one or the other of these kinases. So all these microRNAs, for example, uh, downregulate a co-activator of uh, uh, this kinase here. This microRNA here, which you will hear uh, again a lot of in a moment, the 19A3P, targets this kinase here, tau k one and also targets another uh, factor, which is uh, an E3 ubiquitin ligase called beta-TRCP, which is responsible for degradation of phosphorylated YAP. So this gives you the idea of the microRNA. This microRNA works by targeting this, targeting this simultaneously, so they have a cumulative effect. YAP is essential because if you have, this is, uh, this is a normal proliferation of neonatal cardiomyocytes, you give the microRNA in black, you boost proliferation, you give simultaneously an siRNA against the YAP, you blunt proliferation in any case. So they all converge on YAP. And the second pathway, which is more, even more unexpected, was a pathway that controls the ratio in the cell between glo globular actin and filamentous actin. The bottom line being that to have proliferation, you have to push for actin polymerization. And actin polymerization in the cell is controlled by a series of at least six proteins that instead favor the globular actin. These proteins are thymosine beta-4, twin fillings, profilin, mical-3, cofilins, and all these proteins push the reverse, so they push formation of individual actin molecules, and all these microRNA target one or the other, or more than one of these proteins. And indeed, if you look at the ratio between globular and filamentous actin in normal cells, it is more or less, uh, uh, normal cardiomyocytes, more or less one-to-one, -one. if you give an siRNA against cofilin 2, then uh, you favor filamentous actin. If you give the, the, this microRNA or this microRNA or this microRNA, you do exactly, exactly the same. You can see this also by microscopy. This is staining of uh, actin with phalloidin, so in green, you see the striation of uh, polymerase actin, this is the control. If you give uh, uh, this microRNA, 199-3P, you see that the cells become brown, you have this actin fiber or cortical actin uh, forming, and this is another microRNA, you see in a, in a, in a fibroblast, in a, sorry, in a cardiomyocyte, and also in a fibroblast, you see this big cortical actin formation and this correlates with the proliferation, the same pattern as you see with the nesRNA against cofilin to, again, you see the formation of these cortical bundles of cells. 
Well, regenerating the heart of a mouse is relatively simple because the heart of a mouse is this big. Much more difficult to regenerate the heart of a human, and, uh, but you can test that in a large animal model. And so we moved up to see if uh, there might be regeneration in pigs. The pigs have anatomy and physiology that's very similar to humans. So in collaboration with Fabio Recchia here in Italy, in Pisa, we started the experiment in uh, um, uh, farm pigs, juvenile farm pigs, in which we mimicked uh, a, a, a clinical situation. So basically, we occluded uh, a branch of the left uh, anterior descent of the coronary artery for 90 minutes. Then the patient is brought to the cath lab, is revascularized, and so we released the occlusion and we did reperfusion. And then after reperfusion, we injected in 10 sites around the border zone a navy vector expressing this microRNA. And then we followed up these animals by magnetic resonance images and all other um, parameters for one month. And the results were truly spectacular within one month. Really too good to be true. If you see, this is a, uh, this is a result by MRI of uh, ejection fraction, which measures uh, the amount of blood which is pumped out by the heart, uh, every heartbeat. So in normal conditions in pigs, uh, it is between se uh, 70 and 80. Two days after myocardial infarction in both the control and the treated group, control is in white, it decreased. Uh, the extent of decrease was not different between the two. And then, however, if you look at one month, there was still a decrease in the animals with uh, uh, the control, and so they go towards heart failure, while well, it was completely restored in the animal treated with the mountain A, a similar to the uh, uninfarcted animals. Same was true for other parameters like stroke, volume, or the dilatation of the heart. They were all preserved. Infarct size was also spectacular. This is mass of the infarct and size of the infarct. No difference in two days for both parameters. However, if you look at the infarct mass at 28 days, it's very significantly reduced. Infarct size the same in the animal treated with V control. You look at uh, histologically, there is a lot of scar and fibrosis in the control animals. Much more muscle tissue in the animals treated with microRNA. Uh, 199A. These are some uh, uh, representative MRI images. So this is the same animal treated with the control, and this is the same animal uh, uh, treated with 199A. So this is the same animal seen in week one, week four, and week eight. And these are uh, heart sections from the uh, 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 apex of the heart up to the top of the heart. So this is the apex and this is the base of the heart. If you look at the middle sections, so basically this is the left ventricle, the right ventricle. Uh, the infarct zone here is contrasting by the software in red. So this is a infarct septum and a part of the anterior uh, wall. And you see that progressively this after four weeks or eight weeks is uh, transformed into a large scar. You see also that the ventricle is uh, um, uh, enlarged. And this is an animal instead treated with 199A, same big infarct in one week, but still you see that uh, four weeks and eight weeks, the infarct is uh, really much uh, smaller. If you look closely, you can also see that uh, there seems to be island of regenerating tissue, and uh, here the infarct is completely <coughs> so really disappeared inside, uh, inside the ventricle. Uh, the, this movie is also impressive. This is an animal that uh, uh, received the infarct and uh, an AV control. So you see in one month, a large dilatation of the left ventricle. The septum is very thin. The anterior wall of the ventricle does not move. And these are two animals that have been injected with the viral vector. And you see that there is much more vascular, uh, muscular tissue and there is less dilatation. You also see that the kinetics is much, much better. One doesn't need to be a cardiologist to see the, the difference. This uh, correlated with uh, a very significant increase in the amount of uh, proliferating cardiomyocytes in the infarct border zone. So this small amount of cardiomyocytes that would normally replicate after infarct became really a large, a large amount. This is seen, seen here in the histological section by staining with KI67. These are controls, and these are two magnifications in the AV-treated animals. See the scar and the infarct border zone where we injected the vector, there are these big cells 
the nucleus of which become positive for Ki67. You see even here chromosomes. For the cell that's dividing again to magnification in treated animals, this is a big scar. You see these large cells that uh, proliferate. This is really uh, absolutely impressive. I've never seen in uh, ever uh, something like this. Um, in some animals, we also gave BRDU for 12 days, so we measure the amount of BRDU <coughs> positive, uh, positive cells. This is the control uh, cell. You see very few cells in the, in the infarct. While in the uh, animals treated with AV199A, then uh, you see that there are many more hemomagnification cardiomyocytes with the nucleus that is positive for BRDU incorporation. And this correlated with the de differentiation of cardiomyocytes in zebrafish uh, and in salamander. In zebrafish, they study very well. Uh, cardiomyocyte proliferation for regeneration is accompanied by slight de differentiation and the re-expression of uh, uh, markers like GATA4, which is a transcription factor which is expressed during uh, embryonal uh, 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 fetal development. And indeed, in the infrared border zone, we observe the number of large cells expressing uh, uh, GATA4. And uh, here again, some picture, you see, this is the infarct. Uh, this is where we injected our vector. You see this large number of cardiomyocyte positive for, for GATA4. Never, never seen this in any, in any uh, normal, normal physiology or pathology. We were very happy and started to, to, uh, to say, OK, we have really something that can be brought forward. But we made the mistake to follow these animals for longer than one month. <laughs> and uh, once they reached uh, uh, seven or eight weeks, they all synchronously died. And they synchronously died because of arrhythmias. Uh, so from uh, night to day, they were dead. Perfect uh, the, the day before. And uh, uh, we found dead them in the night. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, they all had uh, an, an electric transducer implanted. And uh, so we could follow what happened their heart. And you see, this is the death of a pig at eight weeks after MI. You see a sinus rhythm that becomes a, a ventricular uh, torsade ventricular uh, fibrillation, and then uh, progressively the heart stopped beating, and the animal the animal died. And the reason for this uh, uh, is probably related to the fact that uh, you cannot push proliferation and the differentiation of cells if you don't have a way to control this. So, and and the timing, the synchronous timing, only after the seven or eight weeks. Uh, from three terms, or more than one month and a half, it is because the regenerated myocardium probably reached a threshold by which the electrical uh, uh, disturbance of this new tissue that uh, was not mature caused the heart, caused re-entry electric circuit that eventually caused ventricular fibrillation. And, uh, and, uh, and we also found something else very, very interesting. You know that uh, in the heart, uh, basically, there are no tumors, and so tumors are very, very rare. However, see what we observed in uh, four animals that were injected with uh, AV expressing microRNA-98. Uh, I, I forgot to say that uh, when, once you transduce the AV, this stays there forever. So basically, uh, AV expressed genes uh, with, uh, for the whole life of the animals normally. And we saw infiltration of tissue with uh, these uh, cluster of cells. And these cells were negative for marker of differentiated cells like uh, alpha-actinin. Uh, but they were highly proliferating. This is Ki67, so these highly proliferating and infiltrating cells in the tissue. The cells were not derived from the circulation, negative for circulating markers like CD44, not endothelial cells, and so negative for CD34. Uh, they were negative for marker of differentiated um, um, myoblast cells, HHF35 or Desmin, this is the infiltration cell are negative, the remaining myocardium is positive. However, they were highly positive for markers of indifferentiated myoblasts, like GATA4 again, see all the cells are positive, or myogeny. Myogeny, for example, is a marker that is used by pathologists to diagnose rhabdomyosarcomas, or malignant sarcomas of a skeletal uh, of skeletal masses is not normally seen in any pathology in the heart, but these cells were highly positive. So basically what we obtained here is uh, to 
induce, uh, uh, you want to call it a tumor. Our pathology says that there are no tumors in the heart, so you, but by all means, uh, I, I believe that this could be, could be a tumor. For us, I have to say that uh, at the beginning it was a disappointment, but then at the end it turned into something very exciting because this is a, the, the indirect demonstration that we have in our hands, something that biologically is very powerful. When I, when I told this, uh, this uh, way of reasoning to, to a friend, uh, in, in, uh, he's not a scientist, he told me, well, you scientists uh, are, are very funny. You, there is an organ in the body who doesn't form tumors, and now you are telling me that you are happy because you could induce tumors in these <laughs> organs. <laughs> but this is exactly the truth. And so the, the way is, uh, the, the problem is uh, how to find a way. Oh, um, viral vectors have another problem, so that uh, if you express a microRNA with a viral vector, you are never sure of which microRNA strands you produce, the 5P or the 3P. Because in our screening, for example, we identify microRNA 199 3P as the pro-regenerative effect. But in the big hearts, now we know that we express a double amount of this, also the 5P, which could have these deleterious effects. So the, in, in an elegant way and an easy way to circumvent this problem, this is a, the last set of, of, of pictures that I'm, I'm going to show, is it get rid of AV vectors. I, I come from the gene therapy field. I have been in the fields in the early 90s, but I don't believe that gene therapy is the future. Uh, gene therapy is uh, the current solution for uh, conditions in which uh, we don't have an alternative treatment. But uh, in the future, gene therapy will be substituted by therapy with small nucleic acids, not viral vectors, or for inherited diseases by gene correction. Now we are in a window of time where we need still viral vectors to do that. But since we are delivering a microRNA, we could think of delivering a microRNA in the form of a naked molecule. Now, there is an assumption in the field that uh, if you inject a microRNA in vivo, this is uh, degraded in a few hours. Absolutely not true. If you take a microRNA and you inject uh, in the heart, and these are the endogenous level, these are the transfected level, and after two days from injection, you have more than 200 times uh, uh, of the endogenous cardiac level. And then it is true that it goes down uh, with the kinetics by which uh, at 12 days uh, it is still there. And not only it is there, but it is there in an active form because for this microRNA we know some targets, for example, these genes here, Homer 1, click 5, and we see that these are downregulated. One of these uh, keeps also being downregulated at 12 days, so it is there in an active form. And if we do this injection, in neonates, injection is made by the naked microRNA with only some lipids, uh, commercial RNA IMAX, so a commercial lipid, uh, cationic lipid formulation. You see, these are neonate mice injected with uh, these two microRNAs. This is a control. This is a left ventricle, this is a right ventricle. And the proliferating cells here are in uh, red. And uh, this is uh, the aorta and the pulmonary vein. The, the vessels are highly proliferating in a neonate uh, animals. You see that you have these hearts, which you can appreciate are bigger. They have much larger left uh, ventricles than uh, these. And they have much more uh, ventricles because there are many more proliferating cells. You don't need to turn the light down, but you can appreciate that in the middle of the ventricle there are many cells, many cardiomyocytes that are proliferating. They are real cardiomyocytes because you look at high magnification, you see these beautiful cardiomyocytes that have replicated. And we asked whether this was sufficient also in adult animals to repair from infarct. So basically what we did here was to simply inject uh, a solution of uh, uh, microRNAs in the heart, synthetic microRNA mimics in the heart after myocardial infarction. We converted these big infarcts into much smaller infarcts with a single injection due to this, uh, this effect that was, uh, was uh, lasting. And basically, uh, leave you with these images. This is the needle track in the heart. And you see that close to the needle track, you see proliferating cardiomyocytes like these ones, which are small, smaller, a bit more refractory because it's detached from the plane of the, of the section. It has a proliferating uh, nucleus, this one, this one. Or you see that this one. Here you also seems to see the ring of cortical actin, this one this one, this one, and we believe that this might be sufficient uh, uh, for, uh, to induce regeneration. We are now started testing this synthetic microRNA 
in peaks in the same setting as before to see if uh, they are good until one month and then they keep being good also after, after one month. Despite whether or not we will be successful in, uh, in having a, a clinical translation of this fighting, I believe that uh, still uh, uh, it is important to, to, to start thinking that regeneration might not only be a matter of substituting lost cells by, for example, stem cells or uh, cells in, from other origin, but that uh, uh, regeneration also in other settings, I'm thinking of the central nervous system or cartilage or in the eye, could be obtained by the stimulation of the endogenous capacity of proliferation of the surviving cells. And I think that this is a paradigm that uh, might, might be translated also in other, to other uh, settings. Okay, many people involved in this, uh, in this work you have seen uh, uh, the names uh, of them uh, all throughout uh, the presentation, so I won't go mentioning anybody, but uh, we'll be very happy to take questions if you have. Thank you.